Joshua chapter 23, we're beginning to close out the season of Joshua's life where he led in Israel. And it's uh, your header in your Bible might say Joshua's farewell to the leaders. He's, he's really setting Israel up for the next season as they've conquered the promised land. They've entered in. God has given them rest. Chapter 23 starts off with a powerful sentence. Remember Joshua, who's a picture of Christ in many ways in the Old Testament, how Christ has given us rest. After a long time had passed and the Lord had given Israel rest from all of their enemies around them. Joshua was then a very old man. He summoned all Israel, the elders, the leaders, the judges and the officials, and he said to them, I'm old. Actually, he said, I'm very old. So basically, Joshua's hit a season in his life where they've accomplished all that they were called to accomplish. He was older in his years. He had lived a life for the Lord. And he's basically telling them it's about the time for him to go and be with the Lord. And he's preparing this next generation. And he says to them, you yourselves have seen everything that God has done to all these nations for your sake. It was the Lord your God who fought for you. He begins to remind them. And in our life, we need to be reminded as well. He says, remember how I have allotted as an inheritance for your tribes all the lands of the nations that there remain, the nations I conquered between the Jordan and the Mediterranean Sea in the west. The Lord your God himself will push them out for your sake. He will drive them out before you and you will take possession of their land as the Lord your God promised you. He says, remember what God promised. Remember what God's done. And remember what God is going to to do. Be very strong, verse 6. Be careful to obey all that is written in the book of the law of Moses without turning aside to the right or to the left. Do what God has called you to do. Live according to God's word. Don't look to do things the world's way, but let's do things God's way. The principles are all right there. Verse 7. Do not associate with these nations that remain among you. Do not invoke the names of their gods or swear by them. You must not serve them or bow down to them. But you are to hold fast to the Lord your God as you have until now. He warns them. He says, hey, guys, don't get caught up in the distractions of this world. There are things in culture, there are things in this world that are not of God, and they'll try to pull you, they'll try to sway you, they'll try to push you. They're a distraction that will keep you from what God has for you. Israel dealt with what we deal with even today. Verse 9. The Lord has driven out before you great and powerful nations. To this day, no one has been able to withstand you. One of you routes a thousand because the Lord your God fights for you just as he promised. So be very careful to love the Lord your God. God goes before us. God fights our battles for us. God drives out the enemy in our life. Verse 12. But if you turn away and ally yourselves with the survivors of these nations, they remain among you. And if you intermarry with them and you associate with them, if you begin to yoke with people who are yoked with the world, is the principle the Bible is sharing with us. We need to be careful in our relationships of who we are connected to, who we are in covenant with. Instead, they will become snares and traps for you, whips on your back and thorns in your eyes until you perish from the good land which the Lord your God has given you. He says, look, if you get in the wrong relationships, they'll become a trap, they'll become a snare, they'll hurt you, they'll be like whips and thorns. They will sting you. Verse 14, now I'm about to go all the way of the earth. You know with all your heart and soul that not one of the good promises the Lord your God gave you has failed. Every promise has been fulfilled. Not one has failed. But just as all the good things the Lord your promise has come to you, so he will bring on you all the evil things he has threatened until the Lord your God has destroyed you from this good land he has given you if you violate the covenant of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. And you go. And serve other gods and bow down to them. The Lord's anger will burn against you and you will quickly perish from the good land he has given you. Here's basically the deal. It's really simple. He says, if you do things God's way, God will bless you as he said he will. But if you don't do things God's way, and God warned you if you don't do things his way, that there is going to be destruction and pain in your future because you got outside of the covering and the blessings of God. Same applies for us today. Yes, Jesus saved us. Yes, he has covered our sins. Yes, he is rich in mercy and grace, and he's lavished it on you and me. But the reality is this. Even though we're saved, we still have choices to make every day. And we have the choice of whether we're going to serve God and do things God's way and live our life according to God's word, or if we're going to go the way of the world. It's a choice that we have. Jesus still loves us. Jesus is still for us. But we have a choice. And the choices we make will define the future that we have. 
And we have to be wise in our relationships. We have to be wise with who we associate with, with what we associate with. And there is a difference because people will say, well, are you saying that I should only be around Christians? I'm saying we can minister to this world, but we don't have to make covenant with this world. We can walk with brothers and sisters in Christ. We can be in relationship with brothers and sisters in Christ in deep covenant friendship, but we minister to the world. And we have to be careful that as we minister to the world, we don't get caught up in the world, as so many people do even to this day. He finishes out this book of the Bible with chapter 24, verse 1. Then Joshua assembled all the tribes of Israel at Shechem. He summoned the elders, leaders, judges, and officials of Israel, and they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, so he's speaking that this is, this is what the Lord says, the Lord, the God of Israel. This is what he says. He begins to quote really interesting details. Long ago, your ancestors, including Terah, the father of Abraham and Nahor, lived beyond the Euphrates rivers and worshiped other gods. It's an interesting picture because it gives the impression um, it gives the impression, it's not absolute, but it gives the impression theologically that Abraham's dad, uh, Terat, didn't know God, didn't have a relationship with God, didn't love the Lord. That the relationship began with Abraham, who's often referred to as the father of our faith, that God took Abraham out of something and brought him into something better. Verse three, but I took your father, Abraham. It doesn't say your father, Terat, your father, Abraham. I took him from the land beyond the Euphrates, and I led him throughout Canaan, and I gave him many descendants. I gave him Isaac, and to Isaac I gave Jacob and Esau. I assigned the hill country of Seir to Esau, but Jacob and his family went down to Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron and afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there, and I brought you out. He basically is reminding them that he delivered them, that he saved them from their oppressors. He brought them, Pharaoh had assigned taskmasters over them to afflict them with many burdens. We learn in the book of Exodus, basically God is saying, I saved you from your mess. Verse six, when I brought you people out of Egypt, you came to the sea and the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and horsemen as far as the Red Sea. Your enemy pursued you, but you cried to the Lord for help and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians. He brought the sea over them and covered them. You saw with your own eyes what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. I brought you to the land of the Amorites who lived east of the Jordan. They fought against you, but I gave them into your hands. I destroyed them before you and you took possession of their land. When Balak, son of Zippor, he's just giving them a history of all that had taken place when they were in the wilderness to remind them so that they wouldn't forget. Because oftentimes we think we need to learn something new in our walk with God, but the reality is we need to be reminded of what we already know. When Balak, son of Zippor, the king of Moab, prepared to fight against Israel, he sent for Balaam, son of Beor, to put a curse on you, but I wouldn't listen to Balaam. So I blessed you again and again, and I delivered you out of his hand, says the Lord. Then you crossed the Jordan and came to Jericho. The citizens of Jericho fought against you, as did the Amorites, Perizzites, Canaanites, Hittites, Girgashites, Hivites, Jebusites, but I gave them in your hands. There's been many attacks. There's been many waves that might've come against you, but the Lord is saying this, I've given your enemy into your hands. I sent the hornet ahead of you, which drove them out before you and the two Amorite kings. You didn't even do it with your own sword and bow. There's some battles you don't even have to fight. God has fought them for you. So I gave you a land on which you did not toil and cities you did not build, and you live in them and eat from vineyards and olive groves that you did not plant. You walk in a blessing. I walk in a blessing. I've received things in my life that I didn't have to work for, that I didn't have to strive for, but God provided them by his strength and by his power. Now, verse 14, here it gets, here's the call to action, if you will. Now fear the Lord and serve him with all faithfulness. Throw away the gods your ancestors worship beyond the Euphrates rivers and in Egypt and serve the Lord. Throw away the junk from the past and serve the Lord. But if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself who you will serve whether the gods your ancestors served beyond the Euphrates or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living, whether the things of the past or the things of the present. He said, you can choose, but as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. My home, we're committed to God. Then the people answered, verse 16, we begin to have this dialogue take place. Far be it from us to forsake the Lord to serve other gods. It was the Lord our God himself who brought us and our parents up out of Egypt from that land of slavery and performed those great signs before our eyes. He protected us on our entire journey and among all the nations through which we traveled. The Lord drove them out before the nations, including the Amorites who lived in there. We too will serve the Lord because he is our God. 
Joshua then begins to say to the people, eh, you're not able to serve the Lord. He's a holy God. He's a jealous God. He will not forgive your rebellion and your sins. If you abandon God, if you forsake him and you serve foreign gods, he'll turn and he'll bring disaster on you and make an end of you after he has been good to you. But the people said to Joshua, no, 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 no. We will serve the Lord. We swear, we choose God. Joshua said, okay, verse 22. You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen to serve the Lord. And the people replied back, yes, we are witnesses. Now then, said Joshua, throw away your foreign gods that are among you and yield your hearts to the Lord, the God of Israel. Throw out anything that remains in your life that's of the world and goes against God. And the people said to Joshua, we will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant for the people and there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them decrees and laws. And Joshua recorded these things in the book of the law of God. Then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak near the holy place of the Lord. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to your God. Then Joshua dismissed the people, each to their own inheritance, each to their own land. After these things, we're going to close out the book with some history. After these things, Joshua, son of Nun, the servant of the Lord, died at the age of 110. They buried him in the land of his inheritance at Timnath Sarai in the hill country of Ephraim, north of Mount Gash. Israel served the Lord throughout the time, throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him and who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. And Joseph's bone, which the Israelites had brought it from Egypt, were buried at Shechem in the tract of land that Jacob bought for a hundred pieces of silver from the sons of Amor, the father of Shechem. This became the inheritance of Joseph's descendants. And Eleazar, son of Aaron, died and was buried at Gibeah which had been allotted to his son Phinehas in the hill country of Ephraim. I want to highlight one scripture and we'll close our video with this. Verse 31. I want to read it again for you and I want us to process it, pray about it today, think about it. It's one God's highlighted on my heart. Israel served the Lord throughout the lifetime of Joshua and of the elders who outlived him who had experienced everything the Lord had done for Israel. There was a generation that had walked with God and had seen God move in a mighty way. And as long as they were there, Israel served the Lord. What the passage doesn't say at this point in time, and we'll learn later as we jump into Judges next, is that after this generation died, a generation came up that did not serve the Lord. And they would make choices that were not in alignment with the Lord. And what God's put in my heart as a parent, and whether your parent, grandparent, or will be one one day, we need to be so careful and cognizant as we raise up the next generation. Because there's a faith that we have that we're called to help the next generation to walk and grow in. And they need to be able to experience God move in a mighty way in their life. And the stories of God moving in our life are awesome. But they can only sustain the next generation for so long. The next generation has to experience God in their life. And so I, I share this respectfully with parents especially. My, my job and your job as a parent is to help lead our children into relationship with God, to, to model it for them, to share with them the stones of remembrance, to share with them what God's done in our life, to not hide from them the good and the bad that we've had to walk through, but to share it with them in a healthy way. But the greatest, the greatest calling or the greatest mandate that we have is to encourage them to walk in a relationship with God on their own so that they can experience so that they can have a testimony of how God has moved in their life. Because I love the stories that my dad tells me of how God moved in his life and how God called him and my mom to a, to a city in Northwest Florida and how God used them to plant a, a church in a storefront and eventually, you know, it would cover a region and that God moved in mighty ways. And that's awesome. And it inspires me. But what sustains me is where I've seen God move in my life. 
And what my parents were able to do was they were able, and I, I encourage this for you and for me, is they were able to show me what God has done, what God has promised in the word, what God has done in their life. And they encouraged me and they encouraged my brother's name's Victor. They encouraged us to walk with God so that we could experience the same in our life and to have, and my brother has. And what sustains me is that I've seen God move in my life. I've seen God move in my parents' life. And I know that the calling for my wife and I right now, we, we have two children, we may have more one day, but is in the life of Sophia and Elijah. I want them to walk with God. And I want that generation to have a testimony like our generation. In fact, I, I want that generation to have a testimony that's even greater than our generation because our legacy is not how much money we leave in the bank. It's not the name that we make for ourselves. Our legacy is sharing Jesus Christ from one generation to the next until Jesus returns. That's the mission. That's the mandate to go and make disciples. Be blessed today. Thank you.